Good morning, friends, colleagues in China, and good evening, friends, uh, colleagues in North America. Uh, welcome to the uh, Pre-ASCO China Summit webinar session two. Uh, the title of this seminar is Outlicensing and the Globalization of China Innovative Medicine. Uh, my name is Roger Law. Uh, it's, it's a great honor and a privilege uh, to host today's meeting. Uh, as you all know, with a strong uh, national policy support, uh, China biofarm business has really entered a golden age. In the past five to 10 years, there are a thousand companies being formed and they pretty much covered all the essential uh, drug, uh, novel drug targets. Uh, many of them have also recognized the importance of global development and have been over, uh, eyeing overseas market. And uh, uh, they also recognize that business development plays an important strategic role to execute that strategy. Uh, many of them, it has been reported that uh, many of them have uh, entered a partnership or co-development um, agreement uh, with global uh, big farm. Among, among those companies, Beijing had kicked off this year uh, with a 2.2 uh, billion business development deal with Novartis. Uh, this partnership was not just considered as uh, BD excellence, it was also considered as BD paradigm shift. Today, we're deeply honored to have two outstanding speakers, Dr. Angus Grant, Chief Business exec Executive from Beijing, Dr. Dr. Jeff Legos, Head of Oncology Development from Novartis. They will share with us on their company perspective. Uh, before we start webinar, uh, we would like to give a, a special thanks to uh, Beijing for their generous support to this, uh, to this meeting. And also there are two uh, housekeeping uh, message for all the audience. Um, after two speakers complete their presentation, uh, we're gonna start uh, panel discussion session. That's when you can ask a question. Uh, we do encourage each of you uh, send us questions uh, through the uh, Zoom platform. And also for this particular meeting, uh, we have a Chinese language interpretation. If you prefer listen to the webinar in Chinese, you can uh, choose the language uh, on the web, on, on Zoom plat platform. Uh, without any further ado, um, I would like to welcome the first speaker, first speaker, uh, Dr. Angus Grant. Uh, he will talk about um, from his uh, from Beijing perspective. Dr. Grant, the podium is yours. Dr. Gwen, I think you are mute. Hi, sorry. Uh, Zoom has it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Liu, for, for the kind introduction and uh, look forward to uh, sharing a little bit of information about the uh, deal that we formed uh, between Novartis and Beijing uh, for Tizalizumab. Um, and let me start off with a, a few comments. Um, uh, about, of course, there's the standard disclosure statement. Um, I'm sure everybody can read that very quickly. Um, but I think a couple of important things to know about um, uh, the Chinese landscape is, is it has really changed um, in, in the last few years. Um, it, it's, it's really advanced sort of its capabilities in biomedical research. Um, and also areas like regulatory affairs. Uh, I started off my career uh, as a scientist and then a regulator. Um, I was at the FDA many years ago, and it, it's quite remarkable how rapidly the, the Chinese uh, drug development and regulatory landscape has, has changed. And this is putting uh, Chinese science in a position to really fuel biomedical advances uh, worldwide. Uh, and tizolizumab is, is a, a good example of that. Um, there's been significant investment which has been made in, in clinical science to bring the promise of novel research forward in China. Uh, and the exciting area that we're talking about today is the combinations in oncology, which have become much more frequent. 
uh, and they may accelerate the range of clinical options to treat areas of high medical need. The other thing that's, that's really exciting has, has become the globalization of, of science to reflect the new state of collaborations across the scientific and regulatory community. Uh, and, and that's supported by an increased appetite for partnerships, such as one we're going to talk about today. So a little bit about Beijing. So Beijing was, was a company really built fit for purpose uh, for developing uh, drugs for high me medical needs. Uh, and medicines for patients around the world. Um, it's a global company, and we refer to it as a headquarter-less biotech company um, because we have locations in, in multiple places in the world. Uh, we have in, in China now, uh, between Beijing, uh, Beijing, Beijing, and Shanghai, uh, a research team of 600 plus with a track record of success in, in that every program being developed is either differentiated or first-in-class uh, uh, medicine. Uh, there's an internal clinical team at Beijing now uh, that has 1,500 uh, plus uh, people capable of delivering a full spectrum of clinical data, including registration uh, programs for all regulatory authorities. Uh, Beijing decided to build an internal clinical capability and, and not be reliant upon CROs, but to be able to do clinical drug development uh, internally. Uh, Beijing has now also developed a commercialization capability uh, internally uh, to uh, commercialize uh, medicines in the world's two largest markets and beyond. Uh, but in particular, we now have uh, 2,200 uh, science medicine reps in China, um, a very sort of scientific, medically oriented uh, commercialization team. The internal small molecule and biologics manufacturing sites in China are now fully operational. Uh, Beijing has a small molecule site in Chuzhou and a large uh, antibody facility in Guangzhou. Um, and now Beijing is building out global capabilities. Um, but let's talk for a minute about Um It's, we believe, positioned for global success. Uh, you saw the commercial. Um, I don't speak and understand Chinese, but I, I think it spoke a little bit about uh, mechanistically uh, how it's differentiated uh, with the FC gamma receptor sparing uh, modification uh, that we believe will improve the performance of the antibody. Uh, Beijing uh, established a broad clinical program, uh, including 15 registration enabling clinical studies. Um, and in th those studies were conducted in uh, greater than 20 countries with a total of greater than 2,000 patients outside of mainland China. So these were truly global uh, uh, programs and studies. Um, uh, Beijing also has had a commitment to, to quality and global manufacturing. Uh, for the case of Tizilizumab, uh, it was first established with Beringer Engelheim in Shanghai in a, in a facility. Um, uh, and Bering Ingelheim, as many of you know, is one of the world's uh, leading biologics manufacturers. So it was a great collaboration between the two companies. Uh, the, the final piece here in this slide is that the future global approvals uh, for more places and more indications will uh, be made available because of the very broad uh, clinical program. Um, there are three approved indications in China already. Um, with relapsed refractory Hodgkin's lymphoma, re relapsed refractory urethical cancer, and first-line squamous uh, uh, non-small uh, lung cancer. Three filings in, in China, also in first-line non-squamous, uh, and then second and third-line uh, non-squamous cell lung cancer, uh, and hepatocellular carcinoma are being filed. There are 11 other pivotal or potentially registration-enabling studies uh, ongoing. So now we'll talk a little bit about the Novartis collaboration. Um, so Beijing and Novartis are joining forces to bring what we believe to be the best of both companies together to fight cancer, to enable access to transformative medicines for patients worldwide. A little bit of the history of, of uh, the collaboration, um, the combination with Novartis to develop and commercialize tizolizumab. Um, 
as, as we know, PD-1 inhibitors have brought really transformational uh, changes to the treatment options for patients where combinations with anti-PD-1, anti-PD-L1 antibodies can create uh, really impactful treatments uh, for patients. So uh, Beijing, uh, when it was developing uh, uh, tizolizumab, uh, was set about finding a collaboration to explore the full potential of tizolizumab in multiple combinations and indications. Uh, it, it felt was an important driver for, for any deal. Um, in 2017, Beijing partnered with Celgene, who had combinatorial ambitions. Uh, however, in 2019, uh, Celgene was bought by BMS, and of course, many know that BMS had its own anti-PD-1 antibody, uh, nivolumab. Uh, so uh, the rights reverted back to Beijing. So, so once uh, that transaction was completed, uh, Beijing then sort of looked for another partner and, and found Novartis. Uh, and, and now that the deal has, has been transacted uh, with the belief that, that no, the, co the combination with Novartis would really uh, realize the, the full potential of, of Tisley in combinations with the Novartis portfolio, along with the, the Beijing portfolio. So in one of the, I think, uh, more sort of uh, important aspects of the collaboration is that we really focused the energies of both companies to explore multiple combinations with our respective uh, portfolios. Um, and I think that's a, a really important thing for the, for the future of, of both Tisley, but also the future of patients, uh, getting the benefit of, of two companies uh, working very closely together to explore these combinations and develop these combinations. So the deal context that, that Tisley was, was based on this, this broad uh, clinical development program spanning 15 registration studies. Uh, Novartis, with its tremendous experience in oncology, uh, will also then co-develop and commercialize Tisley in North America, Japan, the European Union, and six other European countries. So we felt this was the right collaboration at the right time. Uh, we're really very excited about it because Novartis is, is such a globally recognized uh, leader uh, in oncology with a unique portfolio of cancer treatments and, and pipeline agents. Uh, we believe the collaboration fits with the, the Novartis Oncology Program um, and, and its platform. Uh, and we think the combinations with Tisley with Novartis' therapies will bring per, per, uh, potential new and transformative treatments to patients. The collaboration will expand the global opportunity for Tisley beyond what Beijing could have done alone. Uh, and with the uh, first ex-China regulatory filings expected in 2021. Uh, Beijing continues to execute all the ongoing uh, studies with Tisley, both in China and globally, uh, as we go through this transition period with, with Novartis. Um, and with, we have eight uh, these, uh, of the 15 already uh, uh, filed or completely enrolled uh, studies. Um, Beijing will also initiate new, oops, sorry, new combination trials at Tisley uh, with our own or third party products, uh, as will Novartis. So we really believe the combination strategies will be accelerated for this antibody. So a couple of words about what we're building at, at Beijing in addition to what I told you about sort of the size of the clinical program, uh, the, uh, the commercial team, um, we're really trying to uh, you know, work together with Novartis to embrace this dynamic collaboration um, and find sort of the synergistic approach to leverage the scale of each of the enterprises uh, and then look for excellence in defining uh, IO and targeted combinations uh, from our respective portfolios. And as, as many companies do, we, we've tried to build um, an integrated strategy and partnering team at Beijing uh, where we look at our corporate strategy uh, we, we have a team that look at clinical and business development insights to see what would be the best things for us. Um, we have a search and evaluation team that looks for these opportunities, the business development team who do the transactions. And then uh, very importantly, um, uh, working with Novartis, uh, we have an alliance management team that is uh, now working very closely with Novartis uh, to make this uh, collaboration a, a great success. Um, so. I'd like to thank you for your, your time and attention and now hand off the microphone.
Dr. Grant, thank you very much for this outstanding um, presentation. Uh, I'm sure audience will have some questions, uh, but I do like ask them to save their question until the panel discussion. Okay, um, I would like to introduce the second speaker, uh, Dr. Jeff Lagos. Uh, Dr. Jeff Lagos is head of oncology development from Novartis. He's gonna share with us um, um, Novartis perspective on this partnership. Dr. Lego, the podium is yours. Thank you, Dr. Lowe, and to the organizing committee for the invitation to speak at uh, this evening's or this morning's uh, webinar. Uh, it's truly my pleasure to be part of this, this panel and to follow my distinguished colleague, Dr. Grant, uh, in terms of highlighting some of the exciting aspects around our, our collaboration and our partnership. I too have included um, this very small font of this disclaimer slide. Um, I will be highlighting some forward-looking statements uh, over the next couple minutes. I wanted to pick up where Dr. Grant left off and really start with the common vision that we both had around this partnership to fight cancer and to enable access for transformative medicines you know, for patients in China and also globally. And when we first came together, we started under the basis very similar to Novartis's vision and goal to reimagine medicine for patients with cancer and blood disorders. And we would go about that with breakthrough science, innovative medicines, and a laser sharp focus on improving long-term outcomes for patients. So when we had an opportunity to evaluate uh, Beijing's anti-PD-1 inhibitor, tisilizumab, we were incredibly impressed with the, the unique design of the molecule in terms of the FC gamma sparing. They had a very broad development plan in place with up to 15 registration directed trials. And at the time, more than 7,000 patients were treated. And they had developed global strategic capabilities that allowed them to execute at scale and at speed. Then we look at our own internal capabilities and Novartis clearly uh, needs no introduction to the world of oncology. We have been a leader for the past two decades in terms of our drug development and commercial capabilities. We've managed to get approvals for more than 20 medicines over that period of time. Uh, in, along with the corresponding companion diagnostics. And through our global footprint, we have made these medicines available to patients around the world. And we shared a common vision with our colleagues at Beijing, and that was the joint vision to maximize the reach of tisilizumab to as many patients as possible around the world who could potentially derive benefit. So if we start with both the scientific and strategic rationale, we touched upon the unique pharmacology and the unique design around the tisilizumab antibody and its ability to spare you know, binding to the FC gamma receptors. And this becomes important because there tends to be this macrophage mediated clearance of T cells, which can ultimately preclude patients from having that long-term benefit. From a strategic standpoint, we know that over the past decades, the anti-PD-1s have revolutionized the way cancer patients have been treated. And they've actually shown benefit across a number of different cancers and indications. With that being said, we do know that approximately only 30 patients are currently benefiting from treatment from anti-PD-1. And even those that are deriving benefit a good proportion of those patients are not being cured by anti-PD-1 alone. So on the basis of the broad development plan and the already approved molecule and medicine for tisilizumab in China, we thought this would be an excellent backbone where we could add on the potential novel and innovative therapies from our own portfolio, as well as Beijing's portfolio, as well as other industry leaders to really try to continue to extend and expand upon the benefit of anti-PD-1 based therapy. I now have the privilege of actually highlighting some of the very informative and practice changing data that was just presented at the recent AACR 2021. And first I'll start by the second line non-small cell lung data 
uh, comparing tisilizumab versus docetaxel uh, in patients that have failed uh, standard of care platinum-based chemotherapy. This patient population uh, otherwise has no alternatives for treatment. They are often diagnosed at a period of time uh, where the disease is progressing quite rapidly. Standard of care docetaxel has a response rate less than 10%. Patients often progress within one to two months. And on average, they are dying in about eight to 12 months. And if you look at the right-hand slide of the curve here, you see within the first two months, an almost immediate separation between tisilizumab and control arm docetaxel you see a very impressive near 20% absolute difference in the landmark survival at 12 months. And the overall separation of these kaplan meier curves is maintained throughout the entire duration. And you see a median improvement in overall survival of approximately eight months in the PDL1 high patient population and a little better than five months in the all comers intent to treat population corresponding to very impressive hazard ratios between 0.52 and 0.64. Very similarly, the second line esophageal cancer also met its primary endpoint, which was overall survival. And we know that the ultimate goal as oncologists, as clinical researchers, is to improve survival for patients with, with cancer. So if we look on the next slide, the reason why we felt that this uh, partnership was so critical because we, uh, as both companies, are tackling some of the most prevalent, some of the most deadly, and some of the most debilitating cancers. If we look at the pie chart on the left-hand side of the slide, these are new annual incidences in millions across some of the big cancers like breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, stomach cancer, and you see the number of patients that are impacted on any given year. If you look at the right-hand side, despite all of the progress that's been made over the last decade, the, the five-year uh, overall survival for a, more, for a majority of these cancers still remains under 30%. So it is imperative that we continue to bring novel treatments and novel combinations to patients. And our goal and our vision for tisilizumab is to maximize the impact of tisilizumab for patients around the world by focusing on combinations, by moving these medicines into earlier lines of disease and entering into tumors where immunotherapy previously has not been as effective. And the way that we will do that with combinations is by focusing on the four key Novartis therapeutic platforms. These include the traditional targeted therapy molecules, which tend to focus on oncogenic drivers that are well known to play a significant role in growth and proliferation. Our cellular and gene therapy with our first in class and best in class Kimraya, which is one of the first therapies uh, targeting CD19 receptor for B cell malignancies in follicular lymphoma and diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Our differentiated immunotherapies, of which we believe tisilizumab is one of those, and we have a range of other immuno-oncology products within the Novartis portfolio. And one of the more recent additions to the Novartis uh, family within oncology is radioligand therapy, where we could precisely bring targeted radiation directly to the cancer cell. And it's pretty simple physics. If you could actually get the radioisotope close enough for long enough, it actually should work. And in fact, it actually works very well. And we have some very exciting uh, prostate cancer data being presented at the Presidential Symposia at ASCO coming up in uh, the, the next two weeks. And the reason why this is important for immunotherapy is because we have the opportunity to get greater uh, apoptosis, necrosis, DNA damage. And we know that these play a major role in antigen upregulation, increasing PDL1 expression, creating a more immunosensitive environment, and really combining the best of both worlds, where you get very high direct tumor cell kill with high response rates, and then you get the durable benefit by harnessing the power of the immune system to really prolong that benefit and move patients towards a cure. 
we go on to the last slide as to how we will actually execute this partnership, I want to start with a just two more minutes on the, some of the strengths of Novartis and in particular the Novartis drug development. When we think about the scale of Novartis as a company, our drug development um, organization has more than 12,000 associates in more than 170 countries. So we have a very large scale of expertise across a range of therapeutic areas. One would often think that when you're large, you may not have agility. And I think that is not the case here. And we have some great examples during COVID-19 where we managed to leverage our cutting edge digital platforms to swiftly move to more than 20,000 telemedicine or remote monitoring visits and where we were allowed to actually redirect patients from going to the hospital to other third party centers to manage their health and safety, yet continue our trials. And we did not have any delays in our ongoing clinical programs. In terms of dedicated expertise within oncology, approximately 40% of those associates are focused on hematology oncology. We have more than 200 board certified hematologist oncologists more than 600 regulatory professionals that are working in oncology alone. And within the past years as an organization, we have had one global regulatory submission every six seconds. So we've harnessed that expertise, that scale and that agility to bring innovation to patients. And this has resulted in more than two thirds of our pipeline being combination based therapies for development We've had more than 10 companion diagnostics approved in the last five years and more than 15 breakthrough therapy designations. And we, when we look at how this complements Beijing's capabilities, as well as their footprint, we actually collectively canvas the globe and we have more than two to three times our clinical trial footprint when you look across the heat map on the lower right hand side of the slide. So with the strengths, the speed, the innovation of both companies combined, as well as having this innovative and potentially best in class anti PD-1 product like Ticilizumab and Novartis is broad and deep pipeline, we believe that we can achieve our vision and aspiration of bringing more innovation to patients quicker around the world. Dr. Lowe, I will turn it back over to you and thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Log uh, Legos. Um, thank you very much for this uh, um, wonderful presentation. Uh, let's start a panel discussion. Um, in addition to uh, two outstanding speakers, I would like to also introduce uh, three other uh, outstanding panelists. Uh, Dr. Wimin, Wimin Tan, uh, EVP Global Business Head from IMAP. Dr. Mei Jin Liao, Chief Business Business Officer from Harbor Biomed, and Dr. Wendy Penn, uh, Goldwyn Proctor. Uh, I think they, uh, we have an outstanding panel. Uh, maybe uh, what I can propose is to uh, have uh, uh, each panelist, first of all, uh, probably uh, answer one of the prepared question. Um, I will start from Dr. Grant. Uh, putting to uh, 2022 into perspective, uh, what what plan does Beijing have to uh, continue this uh, um, business development partnership with Global Farm? Dr. Guan, I think you are mute. Yes. Um, uh, thank thank you for the question. We uh, will continue looking um, for opportunities. Uh, to partner either our internal programs or to license uh, other programs. Uh, in particular, we're very excited to look for opportunities um, that would uh, be a, another good or innovative combination uh, with Tizalizumab. Uh, we've also produced some interesting data with our, our BTK inhibitor, Brukinza. Uh, we've just got our, our PARP inhibitor uh, approved in, in China. Um, but also our research labs that have produced these molecules uh, have a number of other immuno-oncology assets uh, coming along. One of the very exciting ones we have is, is a TIGIT uh, compound, 
Uh, and so we continue to look for other opportunities for combinatorial strategies. And I think as, as, as Dr. Lagos mentioned, you know, patients really benefit from these, these innovative combinations that we're able to bring to bear. Um, and, and it's, for those of us who've been in oncology for a long time, it's, it's a very exciting time. We used to be afraid to sort of use the word cure, but, but now we, we really seek those cures, those curative combinations for, for patients. Um, and so from a business development perspective, we'll be looking for either collaborations like we formed with Novartis or looking for collaborations with, with, with smaller biotechs. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Brand. Um, Dr. Legos, um, maybe you can share with us on the uh, 2022 uh, perspective from, uh, from Novartis uh, in terms of continuing work with our partnership with our China Innovative Medicine uh, Biofarm. No, thank you, Dr. Lo. And before I think we get to 2022, I, I just want to reiterate some of the key points um, on our goals for 2021, mm -hmm. and that's to enable the first ex-China you know, submissions for tocilizumab, and then ultimately to build our combination plan together, which will carry us into 2022. In terms of Novartis's approach for business development and licensing and or partnering, you know, as a, as a company, our, our strategy is not about big M&A. We have a very broad and deep pipeline. So we only look for those partnerships or those licensing opportunities that are clear, bolt-on or synergistic partnerships, uh, like the one that we did um, with Dr. Grant and, and Beijing. In terms of the way we think about our partnership approach, um, it does focus on our combination-based strategy and where we could potentially complement our existing portfolio or fill potential gaps. So with our current portfolio across the four major platforms, we don't have significant gaps that we have to go out and identify sort of the next big thing immediately. We could be very selective in our partnerships and we could focus on only the most innovative opportunities and we are very open and opportunistic that innovation can come from anywhere. And I think a great example of, of this Congress today is the innovation that is coming out of China and how to be able to sort of work across the globe to be able to harness that innovation for patients around the world. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I can take liberty to add uh, uh, one more question for Dr. Legos. Um, Obviously, many China biofarm would like to work with Novartis. How best they can approach you? I mean, what, what, what can you advise them? Uh, whether they, um, I guess, what's the best way for them to approach you to initiate BD discussion? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to put my email on, the, on today's uh, webinar and folks could uh, send me emails with their interests directly. Um, but we, we have a, very similar to what Dr. Grant showed, we have um, a, a large BDNL organization with search and evaluation and with professional BDNL um, leaders within the organization. Um, these folks uh, hopefully are, are known throughout the, you know, sort of uh, oncology community. We also have uh, a local staff within um, Beijing as well as in with, within Shanghai. So if uh, anyone has any research or, or clinical partnerships that they would be interested in, even if they don't know exactly who the right person is in our business development organization, I'm hopeful through the small close-knit community family of oncology professionals, they would have a colleague kind of within their, their local network that they, could, um, that they could reach out to and then kind of share that. And then ultimately it would get to us over in the global headquarters. Okay. Okay, thanks again, Dr. Legos. Um, let me move on uh, to uh, other three uh, panelists. Uh, Dr. Ten, um, can you comment along the topic of today's webinar also based on your past experience uh, uh, and from IMAP perspective, what can you share with this audience? Thank you, Dr. Lo, for the uh, opportunity. I'm very uh, interested to hear the discussion between 
Dr. Jeff Lego and uh, Dr. Grant. Um, maybe before I answer your question, I just give a very quick uh, statement about IMAP. Uh, we are a NASDAQ company uh, with a capital uh, market cap about $5 billion. As uh, the company's made its name um, recently by, uh, for the uh, innovation in CD47 and recently in CD73 monoclonal antibody programs. And we are also uh, rolling out multiple in-house developed truly innovative programs uh, for the communities. Um, come back to the discussions about um, discussions President Jeff and uh, Angus presented. I, my take is innovation differentiation is the key for any future development. Uh, when you're talking about the PD-1 target, uh, there's a lot of people may think, oh, that's all the story. Uh, but after I hear what Dr. Angus Grant uh, presented, it's really you know, uh, eye-opening to me you know, how you guys engineer the, your molecules and to differentiate your molecules from all the existing very crowded field. That's how this innovation uh, should be. Let's come back to the innovation things. In my view, everything should be science-based. Innovation is truly a science-driven thing. You do not need has to be uh, to create a totally new space vessels, vessels to go somewhere else. You can only make in one small engineering, making your molecules slightly different. Like what the uh, Beijing's PD-1 molecule, the FC engineering to make it you know, to uh, get a slight advantage in macrophage derived T cell potential uh, activities. Uh, IMAP has, sim has a similar idea. We make CD73 monoclonal antibody, which we target a different epitope. Uh, the, the benefit of that we see is that we, unlike all the other com uh, companies, monoclonal antibody, which will only block 80% of CD73 monoantibody activity, we can block the enzyme activity by 100%. And the bottom line is then what that 20% of enzyme activity can lead to potential clinical benefit. Uh, in the beginning, we don't know, be honest with you. But obviously the clinical data now is clearly pointing out to the potential benefit of this 20% residual enzyme activity blockage could bring to the clinical benefit as we can as it can shown in our recent ESCO poster data you know, presentation. Um, and also the, another example is CD47. We also targeting a different epitope to avoid the cl uh, clinical side effect of competitors CD47 monoc antibody related side effect. With those Saying, saying, you know, the uh, in science design. And another one is, I also like uh, the idea of combinations. You know, everybody needs innovations from uh, partners. So, uh, you know, 60% or even Merck innovation come from partners. So I will truly believe there's a lot of thing can come up from uh, China's innovation uh, field. Thank you, Dr. Long. Okay, Dr. Tan, thank you very much. I mean, we know, we all know IMAP also have done uh, several excellent deals. Uh, I guess just for the interest of the uh, time, we cannot invite you to come back to uh, talk about that, but I'm sure there's a chance for maybe next year, uh, we'll bring you back to talk about IMAP, de IMAP deal. Uh, Dr. Liao, I think now it's your turn. I know also, uh, also know of uh, how Biomed also had uh, several uh, the collaboration deals. Um, can you share with uh, from your thought and, and your company perspective on those deals, and also comment on the uh, on the uh, uh, China medicine uh, globalization? Great, uh, thank you all very much uh, 
for, for this great opportunity. It's really, truly an honor to be with uh, this uh, distinguished panelist to discuss uh, on this topic. I think uh, one lesson I learned this morning through both uh, Dr. Legos and Dr. Grunz, uh, the presentation are two, two words. One of them, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Tan just mentioned earlier, right? So a differentiated product uh, coming from a market uh, marketing perspective, I think this is also uh, a word that we mo talk most about. Uh, I think, but the differentiation or differentiated product truly uh, coming back from the true insights on the science, right? So, so you have to find a, your a unique angle to improve something, which is different from from other competitor product. So, I think uh, that that is uh, something for most of the Chinese biota company have to think about. Uh, so we have seen many uh, famous target has been overcrowded, uh, but I think that's not that's not necessarily a bad thing for, for, for the biotech industry or for the uh, patients, because through all these different angles uh, approach, I think um, some of the uh, truly differentiated product can um, can be developed uh, through that. For Harbor, uh, we are a young biotech company, re only recently listed in Hong Kong uh, stock market with only four and a half uh, years of history in, in total. But we, from on the uh, early get going, uh, we truly also believe in the uh, unique approach. Uh, for example, we have based our own, mostly, most of our portfolio on our own internally, uh, technology, the so-called HCAB, single chain fully human antibody technology, as well as the uh, technology, bi-specific technology based on the HCAB, we call it h -bis, where uh, we use that fully human single domain antibody to uh, build up uh, as module to build up bi-specifics. I think th those are the things that uh, uh, on the first uh, um, moment that we, we wanna focus to truly to be a differentiated biotech company uh, to contribute our own um, uh, effort to the community. The second word I think is um, uh, after seeing the, this uh, BPD-1 race, uh, at least from the China perspective, I think what make uh, Beijing uh, slightly different uh, or dramatically different from uh, many other local players is that uh, at uh, the very beginning, Beijing has been focusing on uh, the global clinical development approach and uh, generated a lot of global data. I think that uh, is another strength I see that uh, uh, Beijing can quickly partner with multiple uh, opportunities, right? So, um, so I think uh, th that's uh, another lesson learned. Uh, building up clinical development uh, takes time, takes uh, resource. Uh, but it's also a commitment if you truly believe in, in your product. Uh, for Harbor, uh, we have a uh, early stage uh, next generation CR4 uh, product that um, uh, we are also uh, currently doing a cl global clinical development. Uh, we, we never seen a China strategy plus a global strategy, but a, a total integrated clinical development strategy uh, on the going. And using that, uh, product, we have seen early, um, very promising signals. So we, for example, in, uh, in the lab data, uh, we have shown and then some of them validated in our early clinical data that we can use very low uh, drug exposure uh, to achieve uh, equal or even better clinical efficacy. 3%, uh, for example, drug exposure can achieve the equivalent of uh, uh, cancer uh, killing activity for CTRE4. So, so that, that is just one of the example. I think uh, uh, many uh, Bata companies should, I think, uh, uh, maybe a taking to, to develop uh, from uh, phase one, from the very early stage uh, at, uh, as a global uh, product, a global strategy to generating global data. And that I think will not only facilitate the clinical development, also facilitate later partnership uh, uh, opportunities. So I'll just stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liao. Um, now I would like to move to the uh, our last uh, panelist, not the least, uh, Dr. Wendy Pan. Uh, can you share with us on your thoughts from legal perspective? Sure. Um, I'm a partner with Goodwin Proctor. 
And uh, Goodwin Proctor is the best uh, firm uh, ranked by uh, industry uh, associations, the best firm representing biotech companies. In fact, um, we are the outside counsel to Beijing, to IMAP, uh, to Harbor, and uh, as well as Novartis. So um, um, I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to share the uh, and the, 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 this opportunity uh, to talk about um, cross-border uh, transaction experience. Um, a little bit about um, our practice and uh, uh, in this space, um, as I said, uh, we are the um, best biotech, uh, you know, firms representing biotech companies, and uh, we have um, deep experience in um, IP, you know, licensing partnership transactions, as well as um, on, on the ancillary um, uh, uh, space, such as regulatory, patent prosecution, and you know, uh, dispute resolutions. Um, these are uh, important factors when you do uh, licensing partnership transactions. Um, as a firm, we represent um, both the licensor side, licensee side, uh, myself, uh, in fact, um, I have done deals um, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, in fact, uh, I worked with Wei Ming on the um, IMAP and FV transaction, as well as a number of other um, in licensing and out licensing transactions for IMAP. Um, and uh, 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 the first in licensing, two in license transactions with Harbor. Um, I also had the opportunity uh, working across the table against Beijing in a licensing partnership transaction representing Amberex. Um, it's out licensing transaction with um, Beijing. Um, what I want to say is, um, you know, in, in the past, uh, Chinese companies pretty much focused on in licensing opportunities. In licensing the China rights for clinical stage assets. And uh, um, a year or two ago, uh, led by companies such as Beijing and IMAT, uh, we see a growing trend of um, our licensing transactions. Um, as Dr. Legos um, put, uh, you know, uh, put it, uh, and you know, global uh, pharmaceutical companies started looking for assets, um, the innovations um, in China. Um, this is really, a, you know, uh, the beginning of a, a new trend, um, a very exciting trend. Um, about ten years ago, uh, when I was um, moderating a panel. Uh, at um, Bio International. The title of the panel was From Met in China to Discovered in China. Um, you know, it did that at that time, um, it was a little bit of um, 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 you know, ambitious. It, it, it seems to be very ambitious. But now it's almost a reality. You know, we see more and more innovations coming out of China. So when we do uh, out licensing transactions representing Chinese companies, what are the things we need to pay attention to? Um, it is a very different game from the in licensing uh, transactions the factors you need to consider will be different. For example, you know, to many companies, this is a first out licensing transaction. You want to, you know, get the deal done. This is almost like the priority from the CEO. You know, at the same time, you also want to um, have 
good and to get the deal done on you know good terms, good economic terms, good um, decision making terms. So how can you manage these two competing interests? You know you want to push uh, very hard on economic terms, but at the same time you don't want to lose the deal. You know. It, it, it's a very tricky process, especially in the term sheets negotiation process. And uh, you also want to make sure you have the downside protection. For example, Beijing's deal with Celgene, um, you know, and when B, um, BMS acquired Celgene, um, the asset was returned, you know, like a, mm, Beijing took the asset back and uh, on very good terms. You know, when you negotiate uh, an out licensing transaction, you want to have the right to get the, you know, asset back um, and also get some financial compensation too. How can you achieve that? From legal perspective, you need to put provisions such as non-compete exclusivity, and diligence obligations, and you need to have a very strong termination rights. So these are all like a interesting and sometimes challenging um, issues you have to consider and deal with in our licensing transactions. So my message is, it's great, you know, it, it, there are, it's great opportunity to um, out license the assets, but there are some challenges. Um, be careful. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Pan. Uh, we got your advice. <laughs> uh, Looks like we also identified a speaker for next year's uh, summit. Uh, I'm sure the uh, meeting organization would like to bring you back probably for a more detailed presentation. Uh, I guess for the interest of time, we did get a good number of uh, questions from audience. Uh, I guess for the interest of time, I, I probably, we, we need to be selective. Uh, maybe this is a question I felt is fairly interesting. Uh, this is someone asked that for a small early stage company, uh, when will be the best stage for them to um, start communication uh, with global farm partner uh, in order to initiate collaboration? Uh, I think this is an interesting question. Maybe each panelist can briefly uh, share your thoughts for this question. Uh, I would start from uh, Dr. Legos. No, thank you for the, the question. And I, I would first respond with a question back saying, what is, what is the goal, right? We are very open to collaborations at any stage from preclinical all the way up through full development and registration. Uh, directed trials and or even commercialization deals as shown as part of Beijing. In terms of the earlier opportunities, I, I would come back to the comment that Dr. Tang made and it all starts with the science. And if you believe you have a differentiated molecule, Novartis can help you co-create or create or find a path to a medicine. Um, we explore a range of opportunities from collaboration to licensing to acquisition to simply drug supply. So I think, again, depending on the goal of your company and depending on the stage of it, we would entertain any opportunity as long as it was good science, it, potential mm -hmm. to differentiate at the level of the molecule or through development and with ultimately complementary type goals. Okay, thank you, Dr. Legos. Uh, Dr. Grant, um, anything to share uh, along the Beijing's journey? Uh, well, it, it's, it's been quite a remarkable journey and it goes back to what Dr. Legos said as well, that the, the innovation, um, you know, those of us who've been in this business for a while, 10 years, in 10 years, the, the Beijing uh, developed three molecules that made it through uh, preclinical testing, clinical testing, and to get registered is, is pretty remarkable. And it's a reflection on several things. It's a reflection on the innovation that's happening in China. It's a reflection on how uh, uh, the company was built, uh, building the capabilities to, to do this uh, internally. 
um, and the scientists who, who built the molecules. And I, I just have to sort of say that um, what's being discussed here is the critical piece is, you know, we came into this, this, this business, uh, many of us from sort of, you know, scientific backgrounds and medical backgrounds because we wanted to develop medicines to help patients. And it's just incredibly exciting when, when that actually happens. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult journey. Many of us have been involved in many programs that, that don't work. Um, and it's, it's fantastic to be part of programs that, that do make a difference to patients' lives. Um, and, and what we're discussing today is that sometimes it takes the power of two. Uh, and sometimes it takes the power of two in a really good law firm to help you do a really good contract um, uh, with all the right uh, bells and whistles in it. Um, but as Dr. Lugas described, it's really, it's fun to see that, that map, the overlap map of, of how uh, Novartis's footprint and Beijing's footprint works together. And I think that's, I, I know it's cliche to say it in business development when you look for the win-win, um, but it really matters. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I spent uh, 12 years at Celgene and quite a few years doing deals with Celgene, um, for Celgene. And, and one of the sort of the lessons at the end is, is when you find a common mission and purpose um, between the two companies of what you want to accomplish uh, clinically and scientifically, if that's your driving force, uh, you solve problems together. Um, and then of course you have a, a good contract that helps guide you and the, and the lawyers keep you out of trouble. But um, it, it's really that shared mission and purpose, I think in the science and, and, and medicine that that drives great collaborations between companies. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Grant. Um, Dr. Tan, um, what kind of advice can you offer to those small companies? Well, practically, to yourself and ask, also think about your partner. That's all my always thinking. I, I, I remember that Beijing started doing deal when it's very, very small for $20 million from Merck for one program. That's a long time ago. Uh, but if you really don't need the money and uh, you do not need partner, move your, your, along the program yourself, that's, you know, you can do that. But my, the one critical thing I always learn, always think from your uh, partner's angle to see what they can get out from the deal. So in this way, you can align with your partner much better, more efficiently. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ten. Uh, Dr. Liao, what, what is your thought on this? Yeah, I think uh, most of the, the panels already have uh, made very good points. I think for Harbor, uh, we have encountered, we are internally always discuss about the stage when to partner, right? So I think one other aspect is that for a small biotech company, you always has to focus or focus your resource, focus in terms of therapeutic areas. Uh, for example, we have recently done a Uh, Dr. Liao, I think we lost you. Um, so uh, sorry, my, my computer just ran out of the battery. I uh, hope you can hear me now. Uh, so I think uh, what I'm trying to say is, is uh, you know, you have to um, make a choice. So for, for example, we had a very good COVID-19 antibody that uh, truly out of focus of our um, our and our companies. So at a very early stage, we licensed the global rights to FV, right? So, and, but we also have other programs where, where we, we think that bringing the partner can uh, quickly accelerate and uh, bring more resource from the product perspective will be a plus. And then, uh, you know, we, we, at early on, we will uh, do more deals. So, so I think uh, that that's naturally the, uh, our, our logic and approach. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Liao. Um, Dr. Tan, um, we saved lots of the best. <laughs> what can you share with the audience on this question? I think, you know, like uh, they have covered all the fronts. It's very hard for me to add something new, um, but um, as a lawyer, I do have a different perspective. Um, first of all, um, you know, like it de depends on you are a platform company or you are a product company. So if you are a platform company, you actually want to, um, you know, talk to 
potential partners as soon as as early as possible, right? Uh, in particular, if your platform is um, you know um, is cutting edge and obtaining the endorsement from a, a big pharma partner is a very important. Um, for example, I've, I've done deals representing Bridging, uh, which is a platform company, and it recently did the out licensing deal with Takeda. And uh, uh, this is for uh, target discovery, not you know like a drug discovery, it's target discovery. And I also represented uh, Hi-Fi Bio uh, and did the um, drug discovery. Uh, uh, um, uh, actually, it's also a target discovery transaction with um, Kite. So um, for these types of um, you know, platform transactions and um, target discovery or drug discovery, by its nature, you need to do it early. And for drug discovery, uh, for drug, development platform for you know drug development companies um uh, i agree with and uh, we mean um if you can do it on your own try to move the program um as um far as possible um so you can uh, retain more value um or obtain better terms in the transaction um and also um you know, you, you want to um, put your best foot forward. Um, while it's very important to communicate with big pharma partners early on, just to find out uh, the big farmers preference in terms of um, study design and the um, numbers, um, the, um, the, they want to look the signals they want to um, see. Uh, but at the same time, you also want to um, reach certain stage. So when you have your first uh, first um, discussion with a potential big farmer partner, um, it can perk their interest, right? So if you are not the, um, if you are um, developing a um, uh, potential candidate against a known target, um, you want your um, program to show some differentiations. Okay, Dr. Pan, thank you very much for your thought. Um, I noticed that we're running out of time, uh, but there's one more question uh, here from audience. I do like to uh, bring up this is a question specifically for, I guess, for Dr. Grant and Dr. Lagos. Uh, maybe you can give a quick answer here. Uh, here's the question. We're looking for all licensing uh, assets, and we are developing different education out of the same NCE. Uh, I guess this is the same molecule. I'm wondering what is the per, uh, perspective from Novartis of Beijing on different education in terms of uh, in licensing. Uh, Dr. Grant, this time I'd like to start from, from you. Um, can you share your thought uh, for this particular question? Um, I'll start off by saying it is complicated um, uh, and I have done it. Um, when I was at Celgene, uh, we licensed uh, Dervalumab with AstraZeneca for hematological uh, indications. And then we licensed uh, tizolizumab for cell gene for a solid tumor indication. So, so uh, both uh, AstraZeneca and, and Beijing at one point split indications. Um, the deal we did with Novartis though with, with Tisley is for, for everything. Um, so we didn't split indications. Um, it, it's complicated because you have to think about um, if it's within a territory, how sales are captured and booked if you're going to go to commercialization. Um, and so um, I, I'll just start by saying you can do it. Uh, it is complicated um, and, and you'll need a lot of help from Wendy. Okay. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Dr. Lego, what, what do you feel thought on this? Yeah, I, I would definitely echo um, Dr. Grant's sentiment around it can be complicated, often driven by how, how sales are accounted for. But maybe a licensing deal isn't... Um, 
the most appropriate opportunity if the science would suggest maybe a potential combination, for example, and both parties stands to gain the benefit from their own molecule and they would stand to gain at a greater additive or synergistic degree by putting the two together in terms of the value that it brings to patients, either greater market share, longer time on, on treatment. So that would be another way to approach it where it wasn't it maybe as complicated a deal. But again, it comes down to if the science and the structure would make sense to do a collaboration at the level of an indication. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I think we're running out of time. I, mean, I would love to continue this discussion. I guess we're running out of time. Uh, I just want to give a, a, a special thanks to all the um, panelists. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, advice here. Um, I guess we have to uh, move on. Uh, again, special thanks to Beijing for your generous support. Um, before we end today's seminar, uh, I would like to also announce the uh, pre asco China Summit Webinar 3. Uh, the title of that webinar is uh, ADC Drug International Clinical Research Progress. Uh, the webinar will be held on China time Saturday, May 29th, uh, and US time East, US East, EST time Friday, May 28th, and uh, US uh, PST time Friday, May 28th, 6 to 7. Uh, the live meeting will also be held at Shanghai. If you happen to go there, you're more than welcome to, uh, uh, to join us there. Um, please help to pass this news around. I would like to uh, welcome all of you to come back to join us again. Okay, um, special thanks to our meeting organization. Special thanks to our, our, our sponsor. Uh, thanks to everyone for taking your waiting time. Um, the meeting um, will be adjourned here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-
IgG4 抗体仍保留部分 ADCP 效应，抗体依赖的细胞介导的吞噬作用，会导致巨噬细胞吞噬 T 细胞，可能导致 PD-1 抗体耐药。百泽安替雷利珠单抗注射液，作为目前唯一经 FC 段改造的 PD-1 抗体，去除与巨噬细胞表面 FC 伽马受体结合的能力，避免 ADCP 效应导致的 T 细胞消耗。在动物实验中。分别对 T 雷利珠单抗和保留 FC 伽马受体结合能力的抗体治疗的肿瘤组织进行荧光染色，结果显示，与对照组相比 ，T 雷利珠单抗治疗的肿瘤组织与镜下看到大量活化的 T 细胞 ，T 细胞消耗大大减少。百泽安 T 雷利珠单抗注射液的抗肿瘤活性强于保留 FC 伽马受体结合能力的抗体药物，在动物模型中。与保留 FC 伽马受体结合能力的抗体相比，随治疗时间延长 ，T 雷利珠单抗治疗组的平均肿瘤体积缩小 ，T 氏肿瘤生长受到抑制，表明 T 雷利珠单抗良好的抗肿瘤活性。优势三，半衰期长。研究表明，抗体半衰期越长，抗肿瘤活性越强，而 PD-1 抗体的清除也与疗效相关。疗效越好的患者，体内抗体清除率越低。百泽安替雷利珠单抗注射液的终末半衰期约为二十六天，达到同类药物最高范围，预示其良好的抗肿瘤活性。优势四，抗肿瘤活性强。IC 五零、EC 五零是评估药物疗效的重要指标。IC 五零、EC 五零值越小 ，PD-1、PD-L1 信号抑制作用越强。T 细胞活性越高 ，T 是抗肿瘤活性越强。百泽安 T 雷利珠单抗注射液的 IC 五零、EC 五零达到同类药物最低范围，具有良好逆流作用。此外，伽马干扰素、白介素二是 T 细胞激活释放的重要炎症因子，有利于募集免疫细胞，增强免疫活性。对比同类药物 ，T 雷利珠单抗显示出更强的促进伽马干扰素。和白介素二分泌的作用，提示进一步增强 T 细胞的逆流效果。正是由于这四大优势，百泽安替雷利珠单抗注射液的抗肿瘤疗效令人欣喜，其治疗至少经过二线系统化疗的复发，或难治性经典型或奇经淋巴瘤患者的 ORR 已达到百分之七十六点九 ，CR 达百分之六十一点五，带来更深的缓解，且生存结局优越，安全性良好。并且，百泽安治疗既往接受过含铂化疗且 PDL1 高表达的局部晚期或转移性尿路上皮癌患者的 ORR 也达到百分之二十四点八 ，CR 达百分之九点九，填补了我国尿路上皮癌免疫治疗空白，为患者带来更多生机。除此之外，百泽安联合紫杉醇和卡博一线治疗局部晚期或转移性鳞状非小细胞肺癌患者的 ORR 达到百分之七十二点五 ，CR 达百分之四点二，中位 PFS 达七点六个月，建立了肺鳞癌中国一线治疗新标准。百泽安临床布局广泛，与肺癌、肝癌、食管癌、胃癌。鼻咽癌和妇科恶性肿瘤等领域的疗效和安全性也令人充满期待。未来，百泽安替雷利珠单抗注射液将使更多肿瘤患者获益。